Hello everyone. It is time for another stream. I'm back. So I'm going to see what it looks like on my phone to what you guys see because I never do that. So I thought I would do that today. Go to my channel. Ooh. I hear myself. That's funny. <laughs> So we'll see how this works out. Um, so today's topic is specifically about tank temperatures. Uh, you know, think about it. We've done so many live streams. At some point, we're going to talk about topics again that uh, we've discussed years ago. So it's time. <laughs> Tammy's first. JNY says second. <laughs> Neil says not first. So funny. Guys, I'm so glad you're here. Um, by the way, I want to tell you uh, actually, I want to stick it on the screen. How am I going to do this? I haven't done this in so long, I forgot how to do it. So it's an overlay. Okay, I'm sorry, give me one second here to type this. All right, add. Where did it go? Here it is. All right, so I'm going to put it up here. Um, that right there is the link to my Instagram page in case you guys want to watch the happy hour I did last night with MetroCat. We uh, did an impromptu one-hour stream, and we just talked with each other about books and drinking and uh, some of our friends and the hobby. And, you know, if you just want to sit in on one of those little chats, then you might enjoy it. So uh, I wanted to be sure to put that up on there. I'll leave that on the screen for a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how you get to it exactly, but I did save it to my uh, profile, so I believe you'll find it under IGTV. Uh, so I hope that helps. Uh, so I want to talk about tank temperature today because I wanted to discuss, you know, what's too hot, what's too cool, and does it even matter? And then of course we'll talk about how we control those temperatures to make the tank stay nice and stable all the time. And it's not really an in-depth thing, but uh, you know, a lot of times people will post, I just got a new tank and I don't know what my temperature is supposed to be. So I wanted to be sure to give you that information today. And so I did a topic specifically about this. Let me plug in my phone so that way it has juice in case we need to borrow the screen for something for this stream. Um, all right, so ideally we're, we generally aim for around 77 to 79 degrees. And somewhere in that window, you want to pick a spot. It's sort of like alkalinity. We always say you should be between 8 and 11 dKH. So that doesn't mean you can be between 8 and 11 all the time, bouncing around somewhere in that, that range. That would be terrible for your corals. Instead, we want to pick a number somewhere between 8 and 11. So with temperature, it's the same thing. So if you are shooting for 77 to 79, you find a sweet spot there in the middle. Maybe you like 77.5, or maybe you like 78.5. And of course, there's going to be all kinds of factors that will determine what your tank's temperature will be throughout the day and the night based on the environmental conditions of the aquarium. For example, if the aquarium is in a business setting uh, and they shut off the AC for the weekend, that tank could get really, really hot as the entire office gets really hot. Um, if you keep your house nice and cool, your tank probably will never get warm. Some people are naturally cold and they want to keep the house temperature up, which in turn raises the water temperature and uh, it can affect the tank adversely. So we're trying to figure out a way to keep it somewhere between 77 and 79. And if we, could, <coughs> if we can do that, then usually most of the livestock we like to buy is going to be quite happy. Now, there are some corals that can tolerate more temperature. There are some uh, fish that demand cooler temperatures. Uh, for example, a seahorse, which is in the fish category, um, that needs to be in a much cooler body of water, somewhere around 72, 73, 74. And putting a seahorse in a higher temperature tank or having a seahorse tank that gets too warm actually affects the fish's health. And we don't want to hurt it. We want to make sure that it is uh, a happy, content uh, animal and is in the right proper temperature. So whenever you're buying something, it's always good to find out what temperature does that fish or coral normally enjoy, just to make sure you're good. And one of the things I like to do is go to liveaquaria.com because they've been selling livestock for a very long time and they have really good documentation about every single animal. So if you say, I want a blue spotted goby, and you go there and you type in blue spotted goby, you'll see all the information, its temperament, what it likes to eat, 
Um, what it shouldn't be placed with possibly is sometimes listed. And it's the same thing, and you know, again, what is the ideal temperature? Normally we like to pick something, you know, if we're buying things, we want everything to be of the same range of temperature so that way we don't put one thing in with a bunch of happy things and end up trying to make that thing adapt. You know, we are, we, we tend to want to control everything in our lives, but that one we should not force. You know, we, you know, there are certain things that we shouldn't work. So if you really like that other animal that likes cooler water, I would highly recommend you set up a separate tank just for that animal and keep the temperature at a cooler temperature. Uh, uh, yeah, I feel like I'm being repetitive. Uh, keep that environment or that biotope uh, at the proper degree for that fish and then enjoy the fish. You know, it's, that's its tank and it gets to be nice and comfy and cool while your reef is cooking in a slightly hotter or warmer temperature. Now, sometimes as you're reading online, you know, if you get into the Facebook groups, you'll see people will say, well, hey, uh, I've read that in Tahiti, the water's 85 degrees. Um, that may be at the surface, that might be three feet down, but is it like that at 30 to 60 feet down? Is that the normal temperature? Is that the high? Um, it's actually one of those things that if you like to travel and you like to scuba dive, might be kind of cool to bring or to verify the temperature of the dive site you're at and just kind of see what the numbers are and keep in mind that's exactly that day you're there. But it's still kind of neat to know. And one of the things I've started doing uh, in very recently is when I do go on a dive trip, I would then take a water sample home with me and send it off to ICP just out of curiosity to see what kind of numbers came out of the exact spot I was diving. So no, we don't want warmer temperatures just because you've read somewhere on the internet that that area can be really hot because those corals have adapted to higher temperatures just like my reef has adapted to higher phosphate and nitrate. It's not that I just put those corals in high nitrate and high phosphate and said figure it out. They have been tolerating me, they live in spite of me, <laughs> and I'm lucky. But I, I want to encourage you to find a better temperature. And there are some SPS capers out there that have found that their tanks did much better at 76, which I would consider to be quite cool but it also is a protection. So think about this. When the tank gets, um, is 76, 77 each day, right? And then one day the AC breaks in the house and the rooms start getting warmer and warmer and the tank is rising. I mean, that's not good, but you have more of a margin for error uh, for that worst case scenario. And it also gives you some time to do something to get the tank temperature down, whether it's to float ice or hook up a chiller, an emergency chiller. Or, or even bring in an air conditioner system into that room and just pump it into the aquarium uh, spot to cool that one room down just to keep the tank safe. Um, if you're running your tank normally at 81, 82, as soon as it hits 85, which is only a three degree jump, the oxygen levels are gonna start plummeting really fast in the tank. You're gonna start losing fish. And as you lose fish, the ammonia goes up and you start losing corals and it's a whole cascading thing. We don't want that to happen. So I don't recommend riding the high part of the temperature. I wouldn't intentionally aim for 81, 82. And if your tank is normally that right now, I would suggest that you start working its way down as best you can as we head into the hotter summer months. You know, it's something you're gonna have to figure out. Now, if, uh, and so what can you do if the tank gets too hot? The first thing you can do is remove the glass tops if you use those. Um, we really, for reef keepers, we've pretty much gotten away from glass tops entirely. Instead, we like to have screen tops or just open, uh, depending on you know, your preference. And then having a fan blowing down on the water to cool the tank will help. Floating frozen objects in the tank will help to bring the temperature down too if it gets too hot. And having a nice air pump with an air stone that is heavy, that you, you know, like a ceramic stone that's heavy, it's designed to dangle down in the water, that will add air to the tank while the tank is too hot. So if you end up in a situation where your tank is really running hot because of some emergency, an air stone and pump should be your first move. Another thing you can do is take your power head and move it up really high, like way up here at the top, and have it chop up the water and, and basically create cavitation and air bubbles all throughout the system. That can help a little bit temporarily. If you're using like a maxi jet, you'd have the ability <clears throat> to hook up the Venturi and have it suck in air and blow out bubbles. That's another workaround. But just adding an air pump would be really wise. Obviously circulation is important, but cooling the tank. So here's a trick that um, has been around for a very long time. It's uh, something that a lot of us have done in the past. And you know, if you aren't doing this now, today is the day. I'm gonna give you a little bit of homework. <laughs> I would like you to get a, depending on the size of your aquarium, 
uh, let's say you have a 55 gallon aquarium or you have something larger I would like you to freeze one or two bottles of water in your freezer they're like you know like the uh, two liter bottles for those of you with smaller tanks you could freeze 20 ounce bottles now obviously you don't want to fill the bottle all the way and then freeze it because the bottle will rupture in your freezer so we want to leave some, an air gap in there but having these frozen torpedoes waiting in your freezer in case the tank ever gets too hot is fantastic because you can take the bottle out of your freezer you can set it in the tank and it will help bring the temperature down or keep it from going any higher and as it melts it melts in the bottle so you don't add any of that water to your tank and then you can swap it with the other one you had in the freezer and put the first one that's melted back in the freezer now that's only going to work for so long and you're going to discover it takes a long time to freeze that solid you know so you may need four or six of these frozen bottles total but even in an emergency having one or two is really awesome if you can't do that you can definitely float a bag of ice um, some people have uh, thought well what about you know when the ice melts eh, it could happen but uh, it's going to be <laughs> kind of troublesome to fill up ice cube trays with RO water and freeze that so I would just put the bag in the tank and you know you're you're saving it. it's life-saving it's not the normal day and uh, you know, afterwards you have to do whatever you got to do you know, to kind of purify the water again uh, it may be possible to pull out the frozen I mean the, the completely defrosted bag of ice you know it's just a bag of water now you might be able to get it out of your tank without it leaking into the tank and that'd be nice um, and then of course cooling fans like I said the big box fans uh, that you can buy like a Target or Walmart those kind of places they're usually like 15 bucks they're huge like I don't know 30 inches by 30 inches maybe they're smaller 20 by 20 and you can just have that blow down on the water that can help cool your tank down and get it back to the target range you want of course if you uh, have been preventative in the first place and you said I want to run a chiller then that's great but what happens when your chiller breaks what happens when the chiller is down needs repairs wasn't maintained and your tank temperature is rising so uh, you know make sure you are keeping up with your chiller to make sure it's running just like you keep up with all your equipment you clean your protein skimmer you check your dosing pumps make sure that your chiller has been cleaned and the screen isn't clogged up with dust you're supposed to take that off and clean it from time to time you got to make sure that the pump feeding water into the chiller and out of the chiller is still actively running is clean is running the right flow rate uh, these are all part of our maintenance and it's actually one of those things that it's really easy to forget about or or even overlook because it's so automated that you uh, don't really give it any thought so you know think about it today <laughs> but yeah freezing some water in advance would be smart and it's a it, it's the cheapest simplest solution and has helped a lot of people save their tanks when things got too hot now what happens if the tank gets too cold I know it's gonna be impossible to do that uh, here as we head into summer but if the tank gets too cold there are some tricks they're not pleasant uh, but there are ways to warm it up obviously the first thing would be put in heaters of course but let's say you know you're in a scenario where the power is out and you don't have electricity to run heaters you could potentially wrap the tank with something to keep it warm whether it's insulated sheets of foam wrapping it with blankets covering it um, you could also heat up water from the aquarium on your stove if it's a gas stove and you could bring the water up to temperature and pour it in and you just keep doing this every hour to kind of keep the tank from getting too cold um, and then of course make sure you know let's say you do have power uh, make sure that all your heaters are functioning if you have a dead heater that's not going to help you at all you want to make sure that your heaters are working they're functional they're staying on target and they're being controlled by something it's really important that we don't just trust the knob on the heater and actually have something to turn it off if it gets too warm and to turn it on if it gets too cold so a lot of people have embraced the Inkbird controller for some time now for the last couple of years I'd say I remember when I saw one I didn't even know what it was because uh, apparently it was something a lot of people with small tanks had bought and, you know with, with big tanks we almost always have an apex or some kind of controller like that that controls our temperature uh, one more thing I want you to keep in mind too about tank temperature and that would be avoid a knee-jerk reaction if you glance at the tank and there's some crazy number make sure that you double check that number with a second thermometer so if you have a glass thermometer in a bin grab it and throw it in the tank and give it five minutes and see what the, the uh, the red line has risen up to um, if you have a digital one don't just trust the digital one some of the very cheap ones that a lot of people tend to get for free or was included as a freebie or they just bought really cheaply they're not that accurate I mean literally they they could tell you a horrible number and you're like oh my god but if you touch the water with your finger it's nowhere close to the number on the display so double check those numbers 
there was one brand that everyone got, uh, I don't know, five years ago or so. And everyone was like, oh my god, my tank is running so hot. I've been doing everything I can to bring it down. It turns out it was a bad bunch of thermometers. So we don't want to overreact. We want to double check and verify before we do anything. So if you have the type of thermometer that is the kind that just sticks on the glass and, and basically measures the glass temperature, if you have a floating one, if you have a digital one, if you have a probe on a controller. Um, for example, let's say water in my sump got too low for whatever reason. Let's just pretend there was a slow leak or mm, the top off didn't come on and the probe was exposed to air. So the temperature of the probe is misleading now because it's not measuring tank water anymore, it's measuring the air. And if your controller is good, it can send you a notification that the temperature is no longer within range. Or it could say, I'm too cold, let me turn on the heaters. And yet it cannot measure the water, so it'll never turn off the heaters. So you see, it's important that you make sure all the probes are in the water, you know, especially the temperature probe, keep it clean, you know, verify it visually from time to time to make sure all is well. Remember, when you're doing things like water changes and you're, you're draining all the water of the system and you're exposing it, it could trigger things on like the heaters. So we want to make sure that we're being smart, wise, notice things like that, move the probes to a spot where there is water, disable the heaters, unplug the heaters if you need to. But in the, in the uh, evenings, odds are you're going to need to run your heaters throughout the night, especially those of you that run LED lighting. Because it just seems like tanks with LED lighting don't run as warm as tanks with metal halides that I have behind me. So we want to make sure that we have temperature at night to keep it stable. We want to have something in place during the daytime to keep it from getting too high. Um, myself, I've always wanted to be comfortable in the room my tank is in. And that's why, number one, I don't have a chiller. And uh, number two, I have an AC. <laughs> and even uh, before this tank, the tank I had before it was a 280 gallon tank, I had a window unit air conditioner that blew uh, constantly. It was on 24 hours a day, basically, all throughout the summer and uh, well into the fall. And that kept the room comfortable so that the tank would be the right temperature and I could be comfortable. Because if you are running, you know, like I was talking about before, if you have a chiller and you're chilling the water to the proper temperature, you really don't care what the temperature of the room is. And so I could walk in there and there's metal halides baking the room, just making, you know, the temperature 90, 95, 100 degrees in that room. But the tank's perfect at 78 because I have this awesome chiller, which, by the way, the back of a chiller blows out a lot of hot air, too. So I could have hot air coming from the chiller, hot air coming from the lighting and you know, humidity just from an aquarium. And you combine all that, but the room would be miserable to be in while the tank is actually the right temperature. So instead, I choose to make the room ch uh, comfortable so I'm comfortable so I want to work on the tank or I want to uh, work on the equipment behind the tank or play in the sump so to speak and when I do that it's really important that I that I feel comfortable because like I've told you guys in the past if you have um, if things are hard to get to if things are hard to work on you tend to put it off or ignore it and that would be the same thing if the room's too warm you're not going to want to go in there you're like I'll do it later when it's cooled off I don't want to deal with that right now and sometimes we can't let things go. You know, sometimes we have to deal with it right then. So that's kind of a, this, the thing. So I hope that this little topic that I came up with today is going to help some of you. I realize that uh, a lot of times when you come to these live streams, a lot of you know. I mean, a lot of you watch every single week. And you know, you know that we start off with a topic and then we go into question and answer. But other people see, you know, there's a topic like, what's the tank temperature? And then it says, he talked for three hours. How is that even possible? <laughs> so... <laughs> Have no fear, we're not going to keep talking about this forever and ever. Uh, for now, I seem to have managed to get this covered in about 20 minutes flat. Pretty good. Alrighty. Um, let's see. Uh, what else can we do that's uh, smart when it comes to temperature? You could potentially run two thermometers on your tank at all times you know, if you wanted. You could, you know, like, for example, I have the Apex that has a temperature probe. And then I could just keep a glass one in the sump or in the overflow box somewhere handy where I can just double check the numbers from time to time. That's one method. Um, you, some people, I have one friend down in Austin, he has two apexes hooked up to his system. One controls everything and one is the babysitter as a just in case that he can check to corroborate the numbers of the first one. So he's not actually controlling everything with the second one. The second one's more like a verifier. And, uh, you know, Sometimes what happens is we upgrade equipment and we have the older equipment 
you could definitely use the older equipment as your backup or as, like I said in his case, he uses it to verify things. Some people have done something that's kind of cool. They would run one temperature probe into the water and then they would put one temperature probe into the air and they would set up notifications to let them know if the air in the room got out of range. So if suddenly that room got too hot, they'd get a notification and they would actually know that the AC went out on their house. And so they knew that their tank would be at risk and they got on the phone and they made a phone call even though they weren't even home yet. You know, so that's kind of a nice, uh, uh, what, do, what should we call it, a life hack? <laughs> and so that is something that you might want to consider. If you, and by the way, because I run multiple tanks, I have my Apex controller spider webbing throughout the rooms. And so I can actually check on temperature of multiple tanks with extra modules and extra probes and a really long wire. So you can do that the same as I do. If you are running several tanks, you can basic, and you, and you're an Apex user, you can do that. Uh, there's other brands out there. Uh, GHL has been around for a long time. Reefkeeper's gone, so there's no support for that one. So I don't recommend even buying a used one because you can't even do anything with it. You can't update the firmware. You can't get parts. I mean, it's it's impossible. So don't do that one. Um, but whatever controller you choose to buy, it'd, it'd be nice if you know. Oh yeah, you know, uh, Coralview released some of their new controller uh, at Macna last year. So more and more of those parts are coming out now and people are starting to embrace those. And it was another alternative. But the idea is that you can plug in more and more things and make it more and more complex to babysit more and more tanks. So that way, like I said at the beginning, you have your reef tank that runs at 78 degrees and then you've got the seahorse tank that runs at 72. It'd be great to have a controller on both tanks, right? But who wants to buy two Apexes? So if you have the one Apex brain, and I keep talking about that because that's what I've been running since 2004. Um, if you have the one Apex brain, you can run extra modules and you can keep track of that tank and you can have it notify you if the water temperature gets too hot or too cold on that tank. Uh, for the really small tanks, uh, I didn't mention this yet, they, opt, they actually have little tiny chillers just for those tanks as well. And with those small tanks, you know, let's say you have a tank that's three gallons, five gallons, 15 gallons, you know, really, na you know, nano, almost pico. Uh, there are times where, you know, even if you have it sitting on the kitchen counter, the tank runs a little warm for whatever reason. Maybe the lighting you bought makes it hot. Or maybe there's a lot of cooking in the kitchen warms it up. So you need to really pay attention to the temperature of a smaller tank. I'd say that bigger tanks, more water volume are way more forgiving. And when I ran my little three gallon tank in the, in the uh, kitchen, I had zoanthids in there and I had this really cute eel. I had a, little, I had a clam in there. Um, that tank, I had two jobs, temperature, and top off. <laughs> and that's all I cared about. Nothing else mattered. But those two I had to focus on all the time. There's a, a thing out there called the ice probe. I'm pretty sure that's what it was called. And it basically was this, you would drill a hole in the tank or you'd drill a hole in an overflow box that hung on the tank and you'd put the probe through the hole. I think it went through a, a bulkhead or a uniseal or something. And then the outer part was the actual cooling section. And so that thing was this chiller, and then the probe would get cold, and it would cool the water that was around the probe. And that was a, a nice solution for smaller tanks, instead of having this big unit next to a little tiny tank, which would be kind of crazy to do. So we want to make sure that our equipment matches the size. So, I mean, if you're looking for something like that, that might be uh, something that's still available to this day, more than likely. Um, okay, and then... I know this goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I always say it. When you're doing a water change, you want to make sure that your water is the same temperature, salinity, and pH as your aquarium that you're changing. And if you have jugs of water that have been in your car that are hot, for example, and then you bring them inside and they don't cool down enough before you do the water change, you're dumping heat into the tank. That's not a smart move. So always make sure that your temperatures match between the two. If you have to cool that water longer uh, before you can use it, that's fine. Uh, in the winter, you might need to warm it up. You know, I like to mix up my, well, I mean, I, I do it differently now, but I used to mix up the big 55 gallon barrel of water near my reef tank for the next water change. And when I did that, I did it near the tank so that they'd be the same temperature and pH because they were side by side. How could they not be the same? And that really made my life super easy. And so it would be sitting there mixing for one or two days till I finally got around to the water change. Now I have this big uh, 
poly tank behind the aquarium, and that one has uh, it doesn't have a temperature probe in it, which I love, but it doesn't have one. I mean, I'm sure there's a way I could do it with something. I just haven't. But what I like to do is scoop out a, a, a water sample from that container, and I check the three. I check salinity, I check temperature, and I check uh, pH, which is really alkalinity. I check those three, and if they're not right, I correct it before I do the water change. Or if you're doing little tiny water changes, uh, like uh, some people are doing these automated daily ones where it changes a gallon a day or something, which is only, you know, I mean, a gallon on an entire system is nothing. In that case, temperature is not going to matter. Even if your water was 100 degrees and you had a 55 gallon tank and you changed a gallon today, the tank would never know. So that's not a problem. But if you're doing a decent water change, you know, 20%, 25%, you need those temperatures to be the same. So make sure that your water going into the tank is the same as the water that's in the tank that you've been draining out. That's really, really important. And please don't overlook that. Alrighty. Um, <laughs> Bees Reef says, I just Google what the temperature to keep LPS is, and this live stream popped up. Well, that was cool. Thank you, Google. <laughs> uh, now, let's uh, talk about cooling fans because that's my favorite way of cooling the tank. I've been doing this forever. I, like I told you guys, I don't want a chiller. I've thought about a chiller. I've thought about a chiller a thousand times. And I live in Texas. Texas is very hot. But like I said, I keep my house nice and cool. I'm very adamant about that because I live here and work here. But I have never wanted to have a chiller because I knew that all the hot air blowing out of the back is going to be blowing into the room. Then my AC has to fight that. So it's almost like... Uh, it's a it's a wasting... It's a... <laughs> It's a battle of what you're wasting the most, you know? So I'm running electricity to run a chiller that's blowing out hot air, and then I'm paying for electricity to run the AC to cool the room that the hot air is going into. And I just hate that. And I've talked with some companies that said, well, look, I've got 450 gallons. What size chiller do I need? And was, of course, they always say you need this big one. And then they, um, I'd, I'd say to them, well, can I run it like an insurance policy? You know, think about it. You buy car insurance for your car. The only time you use it is when you get in a wreck. The rest of the time, you just pay the bill and, you know, which you hate. <laughs> but you don't uh, have, you don't call the insurance company about anything. You literally only call when there's a disaster. Same thing with a reef tank. I just thought if the tank ever gets too crazy hot, can the chiller just come on for that time period and then be off again? And basically every chiller company I've ever spoken with says, no, that's not how they work. You can't just have it run once in a blue moon during an emergency. Like, like when I plug in a generator to keep my tank running when the power's out. You know, once or twice a year, that the chiller will not operate correctly. And so I, that's not an option. So, you know, either you're going to run a chiller or you're not. And I choose not to. So instead, I use cooling fans. And I've been using 120 millimeter fans, which is basically four inches, for, I don't know, forever. <laughs> I, actually, way forever. My first tank was a 29 gallon that had power compact lighting. And the power compact were, um, they, they gave off heat and they were in an enclosed canopy and so it was adding temperature to the tank and I had a little sump underneath that I built myself and so the first thing I did was I bought a little tiny fan and it was an 80 millimeter fan, kind of like the type you'd see in, an, in, a, in a computer back in the day but it was made of metal instead of a plastic fan and I had that mounted directly over the sump blowing down and I plugged it into a timer and so if you're going to copy me, if you're like, well, I want to use cooling fans too because that saves a lot of money, totally fine. And you can use any kind of fan. You can use the kind of fan that looks, you know, about this big around, that's probably about seven inches, and then it clips on, like people use them to clip them near a desk or, you know, in the workshop or whatever. You can clip that into, you know, an area above your sump and blow down on the water. And then you plug that fan into a timer and you find the sweet spot. So, for example, you may discover by three in the afternoon the fan must come on, right? To keep the tank temperature from getting any hotter. And then you may discover that you need to run the fan until 11 p.m. And then, you know, as the summer gets worse, the house gets a little hotter, the humidity is even higher, you might need to run it from 2 p.m. to 3 in the morning. And then it turns off. But you don't just run it 24-7 because if you let it run all night, as the house temperature comes down and the reef temperature comes down, then your heaters are on warming up the water that the fans are cooling and you're increasing evaporation and you're adding more top-off water and it's kind of wasting everything. So just plugging into a mechanical fan, uh, <laughs> a mechanical timer 
would be the simplest, most inexpensive solution, and you can dial it in. Now, these days, odds are there's probably some gizmo out there. Matter of fact, I talked about the Inkbird before as a controller, and there was one version of the Inkbird that people were using where they had a heater plugged into one, they had a fan plugged into the other, and the Inkbird would turn the fan on and off pretty inexpensively. I thought that was pretty great. But I was about to say, odds are there's some kind of smart home device that you could probably buy nowadays where you could have it toggle the fan on and off somehow with some kind of programming, whether it's with an app or maybe it's some kind of Bluetooth thing. I don't know. But like I said, a mechanical timer, the kind that has the wheel on the front and the little points on there where you tell it on and off, you can just find it and just set it up what works best. If it's not quite right, you can change it slightly and really perfect that. And then as we head into the winter, you might discover I only need the fan on from like 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. That's it, four hours. And that's all your tank needs. So you can do that and you can keep your tank temperature very stable with a minimal expense just using fans. Under my tank, I have three 120 millimeter fans blowing straight down on the water. The apex turns them on and off. Uh, I do want to mention one thing. This happens all the time. So this is a little side tidbit. The apex uses, um, it has these power bars or energy bars that have all these plugs for like plugging in gear. But they also have what looks like USB ports on the side. And everyone thinks of them as USB because they look like USB, but they're actually called Aquabus ports. And they are absolutely not USB ports. So don't think you can plug in anything with a USB connection into that to like charge your phone, uh, charge an iPad, uh, turn on a fan. It's, that's not what they're for. They're literally there for daisy chaining equipment to the next equipment. It's, it's sort of like um, an extension cord using what looks like a USB wire, but it's not a uh, power supply like we're used to with every other USB device on the market. So the cooling fans I have right now are called smart fans. They're from IceCap and they actually have USB wire on them that goes to a little wall charger like we might use for a cell phone. And so I took all three of those fans, I plugged them into their three little power supplies, and I plugged those three power supplies into an extension cord, and the extension cord goes into my energy bar on the Apex. And the Apex turns those fans on and off as needed, and I never have to think about them. And I also have the fans running at their lowest speed. Now, the way those fans work, they have a thermistor, which is a wire that measures the temperature of the room. And if the thermistor gets really, really warm, in other words, it feels the room is really, really warm and toasty, it will make the fan run at a higher speed. But the thermistor is not designed to measure water temperature, so you can't just like take that wire and stick it in the, in the, the sump and touch the water. You can't do that. So I just put the thermistor off to the side where it's safe and it can't fall into my sump or do anything bad, and all the fans run on low. And they always run on low, but they run. And I don't hear them, and that's why they're so smart. <laughs> and I love that, because as you guys know, I like a nice, quiet tank. And I'm sure you do too. So trying to make the fan run at a higher speed may not work. But if you're feeling the need, if you're, you're saying, look, these fans are not cooling my tank properly. I need them to run on a higher speed. I realize there's going to be some sound. You can put the thermistor on something warm. Like you could affix it to the refugium light because that's warm. And it will make the, the fans run at a higher speed. And then, of course, when the refugium light is off, the, the fan will be back at its low speed because it has no choice. It doesn't know. Um, if that doesn't work, you could put it against a pump. Like, let's say an external pump that's running warm. You could basically seat belt that thermistor with Velcro or, du uh, well, duct tape <laughs> or electrical tape and just tape it on there so the thermistor gets hot. And it'll make the fan run higher. But like I said, you'll hear it. And, you know, uh, I have not seen the need. I am currently, like I said, I have three fans on my sump. Initially, with my previous sump, I had one fan. And it did a decent job, but I thought, well, if one works, three's got to be better. <laughs> so I did it with this uh, newer sump that I put in a year ago, and it worked out great. And I really love it. And uh, from time to time, I take the fans off and clean them. Um, you know, just take a, a damp toothbrush to them and then wipe them down with a towel and kind of get off any kind of crud. And they last so long. I mean, I'd like to say they last years, but everyone's uh, circumstances are different. But for me, I've, I've had really good success with them. I really like the brand. I've been using IceCap fans for a very long time. And uh, I do sell them in the shop. I'll stick that on here right quick. A little self-promotion, never heard. So, uh, uh, by the way, I want to remind you guys that right up here is my Instagram link. That was just to let you know that I did an 
IGTV live stream last night for an hour. So if you're just tuning in and you didn't hear that before, um, you can check it out. I was on there with MetroCat and we just chatted for about an hour. We drank some wine. It was fun. And uh, it's on my Instagram page. I, I'm hoping you can find it easily. And then, uh, okay, so then this thing over here, up here, that is the link to my website where I sell things for the aquarium hobby. And uh, I make things out of acrylic that uh, makes your life easier. So anytime you buy anything from me, you're supporting this channel, you're supporting me. I'm not asking for free money. <laughs> I'm asking you to buy things, and that's totally normal. And a lot of you do. And, and just so you know, a lot of times shipping seems excessive um, because that's how my website fi figures it. And if I am able to ship the item you chose for less, I send a refund. I send the difference back to you. So um, I am not trying to gouge you guys on shipping ever. Uh, and uh, that's it, just so you know. And uh, you know, I appreciate your business. I appreciate getting orders and and uh, it, it lets me keep doing this, which is great. All right, let me turn that off. I'm gonna go ahead and start doing uh, some questions. I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of this Instagram thing. <laughs> Where did I put it? All right, I'll turn that off. All right, so I guess it's time. I'm gonna jump to video time now. We'll use this one, I guess. People have asked me to be bigger. Stick this here. Now I'll put it over here today. Oh, I gotta make sure I got your thought bubbles in the right spot. Let me put a test thing up here. Okay, see? Gotta put gotta arrange this to where you guys can actually read the words. So Charlie Clark says I have a temperature of 22 Celsius. Is that bad? That sounds a little cool to me, uh, but I'm not positive on Celsius versus Fahrenheit. I know Fahrenheit. And so what I do when people ask me a question like this, I go into Google and I do convert Celsius to Fahrenheit and I double check the number and I look to see what it is. Because a lot of times people say, oh, it's so hot here. It's 40. And I'm like, I don't know what 40 is. <laughs> I really don't. I have to look it up to find out. And I, um, I try to memorize these things like, okay, so 40 is 110, you know, or something like that. But I always forget. So I, I just, I constantly am Googling things to verify. But we definitely want to keep our temperature in the right range. So I'm sorry I didn't really directly answer your question, but you did have your name appear on the screen, so that's a win right there. Uh, Hamada says, is the volume a little bit low? I don't know. I, I tried a different connection, and uh, it shows everything's looking correct on my end. So maybe it's something going on on your end. Okay, Ethan says, I'm having a slimy, clear, gel-like substance forming on the top of the water in my sump. Any information on that? That could be some kind of a bacterial bloom. And what I've done, anytime I saw something weird in my sump, there's two ways of approaching it. Oh, actually, there's three things you can do. Uh, since it's a gel, I would take a net that is very fine. I have a net that's kind of a white, opaque look that is more like a... It's, it's more like mesh than it is... Uh, a screen with big holes and I would scoop out those things in the net because it catches lots of it uh, That would be my first approach if a, if a net like let's say you just have a normal green net with the bigger holes and You can't do that. You can take a soup ladle or a, a sauce ladle You know something that's got a deep bowl to it or even a bowl and you can l press it down in the water at a t at a tilted angle so all that stuff just like slurps into the bowl and then take the bowl and dump it in a bucket and then do it again and again until you've caught all that stuff at the surface and then the third thing, if it wasn't uh, a gel, if it was just kind of like a skin, you can take printer paper, the same kind of printer, the same kind of paper you put in an inkjet printer, and you can lay it on the water, and you can peel the crud off, throw that paper away, lay another piece of water on, uh, lay another piece of paper on the water, peel that off gently, throw it away, and repeat, repeat, repeat until it's all gone. And that is uh, one of my easiest approaches. I love that. I, I can't remember who told me how to do that, uh, and it works so well. And if you're having a tank that has that problem, even just occasionally, there's, just do it. <laughs> just get it over with. And then what you want to do thereafter if um, to avoid it from happening, you want to have enough flow that the surface of the water is rippling. And if it's really bouncing around, usually you won't get a skin on top. You might see a skin in some weird corner of the sump because there's low flow, just like you might have a section of your aquarium that has a low flow spot. If you can't put some kind of power head to keep that area circulating better, then just blot it off with that paper technique and peel it off and get rid of it and keep your tank looking good. All right. 
Brian says, I hope you discuss calibrating t Neptune thermometer probes. <laughs> I was hoping no one was going to ask me about that. Uh, I've never calibrated mine ever. I uh, stick it in there and it does its job. And, you know, because I touch the water and know what the water feels like, I haven't had any reason to doubt it. But I have seen the occasional person talk about those probes and how they had to calibrate it or how they want to. And I can tell you this, when I used to work in fast food, we had to calibrate thermometers. And what we did was we took a glass of water, filled it up with, well, actually, it was a, we filled a glass with ice cubes, we added water, and we stirred it till it was a slush. I mean, it was just tons of ice, and it got the water nice and nice and cold. We'd put the thermometer in there. And these are like the meat thermometers, you know, that have a, it's a round disc at the top with a needle, and then a, a probe like you jam into some kind of steak. And we would put that into the slurry of ice water, and we wanted the needle to read 32 degrees. And if it didn't, we would adjust the thermometer to get to 32. I don't know if you could do the same thing with Neptune's probe and put that in there and get it to 32 and verify, and then you know you would know what the real temperature is. Otherwise, there's probably some other technique. Like I said, I've never done it because I've never felt the need to do it. And uh, now I feel like I need to learn how to do it. So I will find out more about that and probably mention it in the nearby future. You know, in some, some blog or something, I'll bring it up. But I've never done it. I haven't had the need. So uh, I apologize, I don't have an answer for you. Crazy Lynn says, I'm battling green hair algae. Any tips, please? Yeah, I have a video on this channel about green hair algae and how to get rid of it. And basically, it's going to be three things. It's going to be pulling the algae off by hand, using phosphate RX to get rid of the phosphate in the water, and adding a cleanup crew. So I just saved you 14 minutes of your life. But please watch the video because I think it'll help you and explain a lot more detail and give you some great information. Uh, Christian Coral says, can I use a 600 watt heater if I have a 90 gallon, if I use a temperature controller? Please don't. Please absolutely do not do that. I am very annoyed that at least one company is recommending ginormous heaters for aquariums. It's horrible. Uh, number one, you're pulling a lot of power. Number two, um, you definitely do not need it. And if that controller were to fail you, uh, you have 600 watts of heat going into your tank. And that's not good. You have a 90 gallon tank. It's three watts per gallon. You need 270 watts. You basically need a 300 watt heater or 250 watt heaters. So I would not go with 600 watts. It's absolutely unnecessary, and I don't recommend it at all. Uh, JNY says my tank is over a vent, so I can't get the temperature below 81. You mean it's over uh, where the air blows into the room and the tank's blocking the vent? That's not going to be helpful. <laughs> Uh, it, it's very important when we place our aquariums in any room that we figure out where the ducts are and actually maybe even have to move a duct to a better location. We, for example, I had a vent, you know, you said vent, so I'm thinking vent now. Um, I had a vent that sucked air out of my aquarium or out of my fish room above the aquarium. And I literally had it straight over the tank because that's where my hot metal halides were. That's where all the ballast were. All that heat was going straight up. So I put the vent fan right there. And once a month, I'd go up there on a step ladder and I'd wipe it down because it would always drip stuff. But at least it dripped on top of the, uh, the what do you call it, the pendant itself, or it dripped on the shelf where the ballast was. It didn't actually get into the water. But later, when I had to replace the aquarium behind me with a new one, I moved that vent to behind the aquarium where if anything drips off it drips and hits the concrete floor and no chance of getting contaminants into my aquarium. So if you're a vent, like I said, I would try to relocate the vent or I'd start using a cooling fan and I would definitely not have glass tops in your aquarium. Andrea reminds everyone, please don't forget to use at Milo's Reef when you're asking questions. That way I can see your questions. Uh, Josh says, uh, thanks for the float switch flip. My Tunzi ATO works great now. That's great. Yeah, sometimes it's just a matter of uh, using it the correct way. Um, it could be put together one way and it just had to be uh, flipped over 180 degrees to work properly. Uh, Charlie says, my temperature of my tank is 72 to 73 degrees because I have a very cold house. Well, I'm very, uh, I'd like to be your best friend. I love a cold house. <laughs> Uh, he says, but when I, uh, but when my room heater is on, it goes to 77, 78 degrees. Will my inhabitants live? Uh, that's kind of a problem. 
because if your tank is used to 7273 and it seems to be working, that, uh, that would be my aim for the entire year. And if you are in the winter, like you said, when the heater's on, if your tank is more 77 to 78, then I would want the tank to be warmer. So I think what you're going to have to do, number one, you didn't say what kind of livestock you had. You didn't tell me if you had like a cold water system where you need this. And by the way, there is a much colder system than that. There are some people run aquariums that are 55 degrees intentionally for like octopus. And uh, these are octopus that need very cold water. So if you are setting up a tank that's like that, it has to be that range all the time. Uh, if you're running a tank that's need to be like 72, 73, like I said, for seahorses, it has to be like that all the time. If your tank is running 77, 78 in the, in the winter, I would almost recommend that you bring the temperature of the tank up during the summer with uh, heaters to get them closer. I would try to keep that. I mean, it would be really great if you could just keep the tank at 75 all the time. You know, just a little bit warmer in the winter and a little bit cooler in the, or I'm sorry, I, I guess I'd say it backwards because you're running heaters probably in the winter. So we would want to cool it down with fans in the winter and we would want to use heaters in the summer to warm it up so it doesn't have that huge swing because that's a huge difference. That five degree swing, six degree swing is too much for your livestock, even seasonally. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, Aaron Walter says, which heater controller would you recommend? Uh, he's heard that the Inkbird is a good one. That is a good one. Uh, any of the full aquarium controllers can control heaters. And then I actually have four in stock in my shop that aren't even on the website um, that are made by Cobalt. They had them available a while back. I thought they were brilliant for people that refused to buy a controller because I was like, well, here's one. You just plug in the wall and you plug your heater into it. And it had a, a thing on the front to program it. And so I reached out to Cobalt recently and said, do you still have those? And they said, well, we've got a few. So I bought what they had and I've got those. So I don't even know what, they, what they're supposed to sell for. I'll have to look that up and uh, get them on the website. But that's a nice option. And another thing that people used in the past that still exists is called the Ranco controller, R-A-N-C-O. And the Ranco controller was used either for a chiller or for heaters. And um, it's like $100 and it's kind of big and ugly, but it, I, I don't know what it was really designed for initially. I mean, I just feel like it existed and then the aquarium people said, oh, I use the Ranco controller. So you could definitely do that. And uh, that's, like I said, that's another option. Let's see. Looking for the next question. Uh, Tony Tone says, my salt mix gets really hot before water change. I cool it down with frozen water bottles. Does that affect parameters, alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, being that the temperature is changing drastically? Well, actually, what it's going to do is it's going to change your salinity for sure. So when you're mixing it up and the water's really hot, which I don't know why it's hot, but let, we'll get to that in a second. But let's say your barrel is 85 degrees of water and you put in the salt and you're mixing it and you're measuring it and it says, you know, 1.026. And then you take the the uh, water inside the house and you cool it down like you said with ice or you let it cool overnight or whatever then you uh, you check the salinity again it could be 1.035 it could be much much higher and that happened to one guy he actually contacted me a couple of months ago and told me to warn you not to do that so I always recommend that your water that you're gonna mix up be the right temperature as you're adding the salt now it won't affect um, alkaline calcium magnesium numbers necessarily but it may drive off the uh, the measurement may be slightly different because of the temperature variance because like I said salinity was affected so greatly so I need to know now if you're still listening and because you, know, you probably typed this 20 minutes ago uh, I need to know why your water so hot is it in the garage are you storing it out there where it gets super hot and uh, can you not put that somewhere where it won't be so hot Otherwise, like I said, the simplest solution is bring that water indoors to a nice cool room where, you know, a normal temperature, ambient temperature, and do your mixing in there and let it stir and mix, and then it'll be ready. The best case is to put it right by your tank and let it mix right there. And the reason I say that is because then you'll use it. If it's sitting outside, you'll get around to it eventually. But if it's right in the way, <laughs> you're like, I got to do this water change. I'm going to get it done. 
Uh, Aaron says, what salt mix do you recommend for a mixed reef? Uh, Red Sea is a great brand. I used Red Sea, I think it was called Coral Reef. Uh, that was one brand I used it for about five years. I like it a lot. Um, I'm still using Aqua Vitro because I have about a third of a barrel left. Um, I've used Fritz. Um, who else have I used? Oh, I used Cybon for a long time. I used it for about six years. So those were all brands I liked. Uh, Jess Raj says, my chiller starts with an increase of 0.7 degrees. Is that safe for SPS? I don't know. I don't know what your area is. You just said when your chiller comes on. But uh, that's a very tight margin and uh, might be too tight. It might make your chiller cycle on and off a lot. It might be better to have like a one degree swing, one and a half degree swing before the chiller comes on. But uh, other than that, it should be okay. Assuming you're in the right range for the actual tank temperature. Uh, Farmed Frag says, I use an infrared temp gun to verify. I've never done that, but if that works, that's great. Solihul says, Mark, do you know the PAR in your main display? I'm interested in the PAR your acros are receiving. Thank you for in advance for accepting me to Club Miller's Reef. Um, I don't know the PAR of my tank right now, and I was trying to measure it recently, and the PAR meter wasn't working properly, and so I went to buy a battery, and the place I went to didn't have the right battery I needed. And I'm, I've had this meter for about 10 years, and I was thinking about just buying a brand new meter just because it'd be good for LED lighting as well as metal halides, as well as VHOs. So I'll probably end up buying that. And then when I buy it, uh, I'm gonna measure the power of my tank because I've had these bulbs in the tank for some time. And then I'm gonna swap out the bulbs and measure again and see how much of a difference I get. Because I guarantee you, my uh, power probably is 10% less than a brand new bulb right now, by now, maybe more. Uh, Hamada says, which thermometer do I trust? My Inkbird, my Hannah Checker, a, a cheap digital one? They all have different readouts. That is a problem. And like I said, if you can calibrate a thermometer like I was suggesting with the ice slurry, that would be great. And sometimes you can't with certain devices. Um, the Hannah digital refractometer will give you a temperature reading. The Hannah salinity probe will give you a temperature reading. Um, I, I basically like to use the glass $3 thermometers you get at the fish store. I'll buy five or six at a time and I scatter them. And then I've just got them handy. And of course, invariably, I never can find them and I buy more. <laughs> but I like to just put those in and just see what they read. And I can verify it or compare that number on the glass thermometer to my um, to the apex temperature reading and see if they're relatively close. And also, here's a very important one that I guess I should have said before during that water change part. When you're gonna do a water change, the best thing you can do is take that glass thermometer and stick it in your tank for five minutes. See the reading, let's say it's 78 degrees. Take it out of the tank and put it in the barrel and give it five minutes and then see if it's at 78. Uh, if you have one thermometer in a barrel and you have one thermometer in the tank and you're just like, okay, they match, and they don't match, <laughs> that would be terrible. So use the same device to measure both. Uh, I do know that um, some salinity probes also may have a temperature measurement inside of them to where you can see the temperature. So that's another way to check. But like you said, how do I know which one to believe? And I'll tell you, when you know one is wrong, throw it away. Don't keep it. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite thermometers I like to buy still exists on Amazon, probably other websites like Marine Depot and uh, BRS and that sell. It's called Big Temp Alert. And it's a big square looking thing with uh, two readings and one measures the temperature of the room, and then the other measures the probe. And so once it's in, which means the room, and out would be if you took that probe and stuck it out the window, and then you're looking at the big temp alert on the wall, and you're like, okay, inside the house it's 71 degrees, outside it's 107. And the only mistake you should never make is look at the top number and think that's your aquarium. <laughs> I did that for, at first when I hooked it up, I was reading it wrong, and I was like, huh, that seems off. And you know, I, I just I couldn't understand it, and then I finally realized in meant the room, and out was the you know the probe coming out of the device. So big temp alert. It's great because it's a huge display; you can see it from a distance. And I could just set it up near the barrel of salt water I was mixing and drop the probe in, and I had a power head 
or a big pump moving water and he would check the temperature and get his glance down the hallway and say okay yeah tanks it's almost there or if it wasn't warm enough I used to heat up water on the stove and pour it in there and let it mix and check the temperature again or uh, I mean you know nowadays it's way nicer just put a nice dedicated heater in the barrel and let it do the job so those are some methods but yeah definitely get rid of uh, a pro uh, temperature measure device that's wrong because you don't want to be misled accidentally uh, Saif says, what is your opinion about the Hydra 32 uh, HD lights? I think they're kind of old. Um, I think there's better lights at this point. So, not saying they're bad. It's just they've been around a while. I mean, at least five, six years. So it might be time to look for something fresh. Uh, Macy's Daddy says, I'm on PG&E, so my power is expensive. I'm sorry. Um, my tank drops down to 77 at night, but will drift up to 82 during the day unless we cool the house. Is that bad? Yeah, that's a five degree swing. We don't want to do that. You're wanting like a two degree swing from day to night. So your tank must be getting hot because you're not cooling the house. Cause that's what you're saying. Unless we cool the house. Um, the only thing I could think of doing <clears throat> would be to warm the tank up more, but then there's the risk the tank will get even hotter. But if your tank is topping off at 82, then maybe it's best to keep your tank around 79 and a half at night. So that way it's only going about 80 to 82 each day. But you have to watch closely and see what it does. Uh, Sonny Sovan says, can you keep a mixed reef at 72F? I would say no. Um, I, I, generally speaking, I would say no. I think it's too cool. But uh, he has a nano dedicated for his blue spotted jawfish and wants to keep it cooler. I don't think you should run it that cold. I think it's too cold for the, it just depends. I mean, you're gonna find livestock that's designed or that <laughs> designed, that is uh, made to be 72 degrees or around that area. Macy's daddy says, how do I talk my wife into another large peninsula tank for Father's Day? I don't know, but you better get on it quick because it's almost here. Uh, Battle 611 says, have you ever used a heat exchanger? I have not. I love the easy questions. That's great. Thank you. Um, Marcus Aurelius says, if your tank is on a concrete floor, you can use a closed system with a coiled tube on the floor. That'd be interesting. I met a guy um, in California that grew, it was really cool. I can't remember his name, but he was growing corals outside. He made basically a big long tank that had a greenhouse roof that was exactly the size of the aquarium and it was being lit with sunlight. And he was growing all these frags and he dug a trench and then underneath this tank he had a sump that was in the ground because that was more cooler than having it sitting on top of the ground. And then he ran tubes from the sump all the way through the yard. It was under the grass. We couldn't see it anymore because you know, the grass had healed to a water heater. And that was his way of heating the water uh, if the tank, you know, somehow, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but he was using the water heater for the house to help keep that tank the right temperature at night instead of using electric heaters like we do. I thought that was pretty cool. And by the way, I know uh, Terrence is doing that also. Terrence from Neptune Systems, he set up his reef with some kind of a, maybe the heat exchanger that was just asked a second ago, and they used the body of water inside the water heater. I don't know how they do it. I actually would love to see a blog on that and just kind of see what components are used where and how it works and how it opens up and closes valves and that kind of stuff. But uh, one day I'll find out. Uh, Aaron says, do you know of any good quality but low price power heads? Well, I can tell you people swear Jabo is just fantastic and you'll get years and years of use out of them. I find them to be very cheap. And uh, I think they're like a one-year pump, but there's people out there, I've had the same pump for three years, it works great, and I love it. And it didn't cost anything as much as such and such. So, you could do that. Um, a tried and true pump that's been around forever is the MaxiJet. And those, it just depends on the size of the aquarium and where you're trying to put this power head. Uh, people are liking the gyres these days. Um, and then the Nero 5, I feel, is very affordable. I actually recommend it. And I keep hearing rumors, even though no one's confirmed it, that there's another one on the way. I don't know if it's like the Nero 3 or the Nero 7, 
but uh, there's one in the works. At some point, we're going to see it. Uh, Macy's Daddy says, my mixing station in the garage is 88 degrees. I do automatic water changes at night, and I change 1% of the tank over an hour and a half, period. Um, actually, I would say you don't need to be concerned, since you just told me your tank's 77 degrees at night. Macy's Daddy also asks, where can I get a fan that would fit into your acrylic fan mount? Do you have any specific recommendations? I sell the fans that work in that fan bracket. I mean, that's that's my measuring. You know, I, I make the bracket to fit those fans. And But most 120 millimeter fans are 120 millimeters. So, I mean, it, almost everything should fit. But those ones I like because they're, they're designed for the aquarium. They can handle a moist environment, and they seem to last a really long time. Oh, I see Andrea put up the link. Thank you very much. Uh, Smoke and Reefer says, on your advice, I purchased Live Rock Enhance, and wow, what a difference. How often do I use it at first, and then where after? You know, how do I know when to? <laughs> what a great series of questions. Um, Live Rock Enhance, initially, you use it three times a week for the first week, and then it's two times a week thereafter. And you can just keep using it indefinitely because you're adding uh, beneficial bacteria that consumes waste. And it just makes your rock look cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. So I uh, used it recently in my tank. I just did two doses over in, during one week. And uh, I had a whole bunch of uh, cyanobacteria that was growing down in my refugium. And so instead of treating the tank with ChemiClean or Red Cyan or RX, I just used Live Rock Enhance. And I just scooped out the red cyano that bothered me with a net. You know, that same net I was talking about, there's like a very fine mesh, and I just cleaned it. I did that two or three times, and my refugium now is a bunch of green plants again. It looks nice. I seem to have what looks like cyano growing like crazy inside my algae turf scrubber. Uh, when I got back from the trip, I just was on, I pulled the drawer out and looked, and it's just like red and slimy. And I was like, whatever, I'll give it another week, and then I'll scrape it clean again. But that's that turf scrubber seems to be doing a nice job. It's definitely pulling stuff out of the water. Oh, that's a great question. Jaw Reef says, thoughts on temperature fluctuations to make coral spawn? No, I'd never thought about that, but Jamie Craig's has uh, been really leading the charge on getting corals to spawn in, uh, uh, in sealed systems or inside enclosed ecosystems like ours, you know, inside aquariums, rather than trying to get them from the ocean. So, Maybe he's got something about it in one of his recent talks or in one of his articles. So Jamie Craggs, C-R-A-G-G-S. Occasionally I share his uh, latest results on the Mila's Reef page on Facebook. So you might be able to see if there's anything there, but I don't know of anyone. And then Richard Ross is also doing some coral spawning. And right now, it's so cool. He got a couple of corals to spawn inside his aquarium. He captured the sperm and the egg and he got them to settle. <clears throat> and you now he had already done this with Project Secor with a uh, sperm and egg that was captured from a spawning event in the ocean, and they'd bring it to shore, and then they would set it up quickly, and um, they'd put it in these little tubs, and they had like a, a plastic ring that kind of reminded me of a sprinkler irrigation uh, tubing, and it would rain down water, and it would be just enough movement to allow the sperm and eggs to combine and to settle out the corals without beating them to death or you know rather than using air stones to create movement and it was really interesting anyway so he'd learned how to do that in the past and now he's doing it in his own he calls it his home secret lab and uh he got a few little polyps to grow and he took a picture under magnifying uh under a uh, microscope so they were it was you know, they're beautiful. They were clear because they're brand new babies. I mean, it was the tiniest little polyp. And he said, you know, it's this big. And I said, can we see the whole frag plug so we can kind of get a, an idea of what size this is? Because the way it was zoomed in, it was like being zoomed in on a thumbprint and you could see some of the ridges. And I was like, I just want to see how small the corals are. And so he did. And it was just 
a couple of dots on the edge of a normal fried plug. <laughs> it was so cool. So he's had those growing out for, I'd say, like the last month on the frag plug. And he noticed that the coralline algae that started to grow in the frag plug was actually attacking the little polyps. And he's like, well, that's not going to happen. I just spent all this time trying to grow these polyps. So he very carefully with tools scraped away that little bit of coralline and then, you know, like a week or two later, the polyps are even bigger and happier and are starting to get some color or some pigment inside their uh, their tissue. Their suanthelia is growing. And uh, it's still just a, like four little daisies on the very edge of a frag plug. But uh, pretty cool stuff. But yeah, so odds are Rich would probably have a great answer for you about, you know, do you have to change temperatures? I know that they were controlling the light cycle. You know, they're very specific. And they were very specific in getting the light cycle just right, and uh, that it would the the tank would get total darkness and then it would get light exactly when it should. And I don't know what else he did. You know, actually, I'd like to hear more specifics. I don't know if he's been sharing that yet or if I've just missed it. I don't get to watch every single thing I want to watch. <laughs> Uh, Vivid Creative Aquatics. Hey, Anthony. He says, I've seen some anecdotal evidence from a few forum posts that higher temperatures can sometimes be effective to control or get rid of cyanobacteria. Any experience with that? That I haven't heard. I, I think you'd have to get the tank pretty darn hot to get rid of cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is a photosynthetic uh, bacteria. It's not an algae, even though we like to think of it as algae. And it thrives off of light. It needs oxygen. That's why when we use things like ChemiClean or Red Cyan or RX, they even say add an aerostone because apparently it deprives the tank of some oxygen, which steals a little bit from that bacteria to help wither it away. But raising the tank temperature, I don't think that would help. Uh, Pet Mula, no, Pet Malu says, I'm cycling my dry rock in a brute trash can. It's been cycling or been curing for two months so far. I plan to put the rock in my tank in a couple of months. Should I add some of the water to my tank as well? No. Just take the rock out of that barrel and put that in your aquarium and add your new salt water and rock and roll. Uh, Dobies says, I came out to my tank last night and the water had white stringy stuff on the surface. And the water was kind of milky, and the livestock is fine. Did my clam spawn? Yeah, maybe it did. Could have been a clam, could have been an enemy. Um, could be any other coral, too. It's possible. Um, usually, in those scenarios, we want to make sure our protein skimmers are nice and clean to help remove as much as it can from the water column, because you're not going to suddenly have little clams everywhere. Um, <clears throat> Battle 611 says the 300 watt doesn't seem to do anything, it seems like. I doubt that's the case. Um, I, you know, there's only one aquarium that was in our industry that had a problem getting warm from heaters, and that was the rimless overflowing tank, zero edge tanks. And the zero edge tank would fill with water to the brim. And then water would roll down the sides into a, into a tray or a trough and then drain down in the sump and pump back up. And the tank just looked like a cube of water. You didn't actually see the walls of the tank. It just looked like water. It was beautiful. Very hard to keep warm. And you had to use massive heaters to do that because there was so much surface area. The top was open to the air. All four sides were open to the air. The troughs were open to the air. And so in a, in a room, especially in the winter, you were putting in massive heaters, 600, 700, 800 watts to keep a 60 gallon tank the right temperature. It was crazy. And even the people that ran those, um, those tanks at trade shows had to be very careful to have enough um, heat in the tank overnight while the trade show was closed down and everyone was at the bar. Uh, because you know the, the vendor hall wouldn't have all those warm bodies, all those people walking around at night. And so the tank would cool off too much and then you, know, you start losing corals. But Three watts per gallon is the general rule, so you must have something really weird going on in your room if that can't keep up, or you're getting a false reading. But 600 watts is way too much for a 90-gallon aquarium. Absolutely, it's double. It's more than double. It's too much. Uh, 
Um, Mike chimed in about the, PA, the uh, temperature probe. He says, the Neptune probe is very accurate, but only in a narrow range. It cannot be calibrated in an ice bath like you mentioned. It can't read below 45 degrees. Good to know. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Aaron says, how is Spock's eye? Rotten. It's just white. Looks bad. Uh, Jeff K says, what temperature controllers are recommended? Don't heaters have thermostats? Heaters have thermostats built in, but they're very, very cheap. I um, mean, think about it. You've bought a heater that costs you $25, $30 to take care of your whatever size tank you have. Um, you may have thousands of dollars invested, and then you have a $30 heater in there, or a couple of them, and something goes wrong, and you start losing everything that you spent so much time and money on. So we don't want to take a chance. So we always recommend you plug that heater into something. So the first thing I tell people with heaters is... Whatever the knob says, ignore it. Don't look at the number in there and believe that for a second. Instead, find out what the temperature of your tank is. Like I said, use a bunch of glass thermometers, verify between all of them. That way you know that the, the average is, let's say, 77 degrees. Then take the heater, submerge it in the water, in the aquarium or in the sump, and plug it in. And then you'll twist the knob on the end back and forth until the light comes on. And then you turn the knob a little bit till the light goes off. And then on, light on and then off, and on, and off, and on, and off, until you get that exact spot. That will now be 77 degrees, for example, because you thought that's what your tank is. Now on the knob, it might say 79, it might say 81, it might say 72. Doesn't matter what that knob says. All that matters is that it matches your thermometer. So now that we know that that light comes on and off right at that range, then you can either turn it up one degree hotter or turn it down one degree cooler and set it in the sump and that will now be your heater that does its job. But having, so now that you've done that, if you take that same heater and now plug it into a real controller, that would in theory protect you from the heater ever malfunctioning. If it were to fail in the on position, the controller it's plugged into will shut it off, which is a great safety precaution. It's the best way to protect your, your reef. Um, in my own scenario, I, uh, you know, because I told you, I go back and forth till the light comes on, and now I got my sweet spot. I go up, I think, two degrees. I think I go just slightly higher. So, like, let's say mine was 79 degrees. I will then twist the knob on it to where it would essentially turn, stay on until it's two degrees hotter. And then I plug it into a controller that never lets it get that hot. And so that way, every time the controller tells the heater to turn on, it will turn on for a fact unless it's malfunctioned. And I have three heaters on my tank. I have three 300 watt heaters on my aquarium. Matter of fact, battle, battle of corals, I have 900 watts in my 450 gallon system. Why the heck do you want 600 watts on a 90 gallon tank? I feel better now that I said that. But uh, yes, having some kind of controller is the best safety net to avoid having a problem. Um, Charlie, if you have a problem with the Cobalt Aquatic Neostat, then you should definitely contact Cobalt and uh, see if there's a warranty replacement if, if you're having a problem with it, because those are supposed to be super accurate. Ah, thank you, Randy. That's what I thought, that the uh, Ranko controller is designed for the HVAC systems. I thought that was the case. I just wasn't 100% sure. So uh, David says, Ranko has been used in the commercial refrigeration and heating industry for years. <laughs> yeah, I um this video has it's Mr. Reefbuster says there's a moving hand behind you. I when I filmed this, I put myself in the video intentionally so that way you can get a sense of scale what size the tank is because sometimes we zoom in so much on a coral, no one can actually figure out the size of the aquarium. And uh, I just thought it makes it a little more interesting, but I know it's some people say it's distracting there's a second one of you. It's okay. I can live with that. I can live with that commentary. Let's see. Uh, Trent says, good to see you back. When do you think you might get your Gen 5? And let's see that shirt. <laughs> this shirt is, says, corals, they're dope. And it's making fun of uh, Breaking Bad. And this is North American Coral Labs, an ACL. Uh, it's a coral vendor here in Texas. Let's see. Um, he asked also about the Gen 5. The uh, Gen 5 Lite arrived. I haven't installed it yet. I got the XR15 Gen 5, and that's going to go over the frag tank. 
during my big reset when I got it. I basically have a couple projects I want to do first. I talked to Bobby, my tank sitter, and he's going to help me put up a new fence next to my property. Um, one side needs it. And then I asked him if he'd be help if he'd be willing to help me with a reset of that tank, just have a second person, and he said yes. So I just need to figure out in our schedule how to make that happen. Mr. Reef Buster says, uh, thanks Reef Trace for letting me know about this live stream now. Shaking my head. Uh, that's because I didn't tell Jose I was doing a stream today, so he probably just saw it and said, let me send out a, a thing. He also knows the stream is going to be so long that his notification actually still does work. <laughs> I mean, we've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes, and usually we talk for two and a half to three hours. <clears throat> uh, Spencer says, would you recommend setting an apex temperature to slightly above or below the manual set point of the thermometer to save on the on-off cycles of the power outlet? Yeah, I would. Um, I don't like things to be really, really tight, so I don't want it to come on like in half a degree. Because then it'll go off, and it'll come on, it'll go off, and it'll come on, and it's just too much. And I've seen people talk about this, and... Okay. <laughs> so, Apex has been promoting the thought, or the uh, saying, that we are control freaks. And it's like they unleashed a monster. Because people are beyond control freaks. They're, they're too big a freak. I mean, they literally are so worried, like, I mean, just this one comment, that's an example of what I've seen many times in their, their uh, discussion group. And people is like, well, you know that that solenoid can only open and close 10,000 times. Are you sure you want to waste it on a heater? <laughs> I'm just like, I've had my Apex controlling my heaters forever. That's what the controller is for. And I've never once thought, oh, I might wear out an outlet. Now, does it wear out an outlet? Well, everything wears out eventually. Nothing lasts forever. But I have had no problems. I've, I had one outlet go out on the energy bar that's running my lights. It's actually stuck in the on position, and I just stopped using it. I, I just don't need it. And uh, I actually put on there, you know, like, always on, so I don't make the mistake of using it. But I, if you have a larger gap in your cycling of on and off, you'll definitely not wear out the component too soon. But the question is, how long is too soon? Will it last you two and a half years? If that's the case, was two and a half years good enough and you know you got your money's worth and maybe you can move it over one outlet and use that always on outlet for like a something that's always on? <laughs> I mean, that's just an example of something that you might consider. But uh, yeah, we definitely don't want it to trigger on and off too frequently. So yeah, I would make a larger margin, maybe a degree and a half. Uh, Christian Coral says, what got you into the hobby? Love your live stream. Um, I got in this, well, I started off as a kid. Uh, my dad had two aquariums, two saltwater aquariums, and so I ended up having a little one myself when I was 11 years old. And I don't remember how long I had it, but I didn't have it very long. I had it for so many months, and then one day, everything died in one day flat. And my dad just got rid of it, and I never saw it again. But uh, then when I got divorced, and walked out of the courthouse, I went straight to a fish store and bought myself an aquarium. And I've been running aquariums ever since. So it's been a long time. Cameron says, Hydro 32s are so old, get some new ones? <laughs> uh, yes, I run metal halides. I have uh, Reef Bright lights. You can almost see them in this video. Um, they're in the center between those two blue lines that are reflecting off the water. But they're just not turned on. Just like they're not turned on behind me right now. I chose not to. Uh, EJ says, the Hydra 32s are the newer ones, the 26s are the older ones. I thought there was a 52 also. I, I really thought 32s are a little bit older. It's just been... I never really got sucked into that, uh, that particular brand of lighting. Uh, Beast Big, thank you for mentioning that. The Nero 5s are now coming with a protective cover, what, you know, like he said, he called it a fish guard. And I've been selling a 3D printed guard to hundreds of people for the last few months, and now that they've come out with their own, I'm sure that I'm just going to sell what's left of my supply and then that'll be the end of it. Um, but it's great that they came up with a cover. So anyone buying a Nero 5 pump now will get the cover, and I believe if you bought your pump within the last 12 months, you can ask for a cover and they'll send you one, I think. 
or maybe you just have to buy it. <laughs> maybe you have to buy it yourself. I'm not positive. But I saw an email come in about that and I was like, well, I'm done selling 3D printed covers. But you know what I'll end up doing? Um, I think I'll end up carrying the, the uh, Vortec 3D printed covers because um, I've been using one of my Nenemy Cube and it's working out really well and I like it. And it's clean and it's, it, it matches the shape and it's unobtrusive and uh, I like it. So I'm thinking about getting them for the MP10s, MP40s, and MP60s. So that'll still be available in the shop. Um, Mr. Reefbuster says, Piggying off, piggybacking, <laughs> yes, off that live rock enhanced question, since it has bacteria in it, would it work like Vibrant to get rid of algae from live rock? Live rock enhanced literally makes your rock clean. I, much I can tell you. I can't compare it to Vibrant because I have not used it, so I don't have any opinion on that one. Uh, Jay says, I'm watching my tank at the moment. I'm bummed because my chromo Chromis are bullying one of the three new Antheus that I just put in two days ago. Uh, I definitely recommend the Peacemaker, Jay. If you don't have one, you should buy one. Um, that's a box you put in your tank for your newest fish, and you leave them in that box for three days where they can see each other, but they can't fight, and then when you pour them in, you shouldn't have the aggression you're dealing with. Uh, Glenn says, I have a question for you. Have you ever wanted to have a jellyfish aquarium or a seahorse aquarium, keeping something that's unusual? I had a seahorse tank briefly back in the day, and I enjoyed it. It was fun, but I filled it up with all kinds of corals and clams and stuff, and that little seahorse, his name was Casper, and uh, he just would wrap its tail around a zoanthid and wait for me to drop in food, and it was nice. But um, jellyfish are really great to look at for about 12 seconds, and then I'm bored. And so I just have had no desire to run a jellyfish tank. I mean, it's basically just owning a lava lamp with a lot of work. <laughs> I'd rather just buy a lava lamp and plug it in the wall and just enjoy the show than to keep jellyfish. And I know that might sound kind of weird, but it's just not interesting to me. It's the same thing all the time. Now, when I go to a public aquarium, I definitely enjoy them. And on my screensaver on Apple TV, I get to see jellyfish. There's actually two different sequences that run about two minutes each. And there's this one where this giant jellyfish just goes right across the screen. It's just, it's so ginormous. But then if you look in the background, there's two little ones going eat, 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 and it's kind of fun. And so I get to enjoy them on my television. I get to enjoy them at public aquariums. I've gotten to see them behind the scenes because a lot of public aquariums, um, I guess the best, they, they propagate them or breed them and they have thousands of them. And to see all of those is really cool. It's sort of like a ball pit, but it's jellyfish. And I, I like that, but I don't want one in my house. <laughs> so if I do something interesting, it'd be something interesting. Maybe a cold water system, you know, like really cold, or a non-photosynthetic system. There's this guy on um, Facebook, his name is Lam, L-A-M, and he is in Arizona, I think Phoenix, and he's got this amazing tank with all these really, really cool corals that nobody can keep alive. And he's doing this phenomenal job. He's, he's hooked up with the wholesalers to, uh, because he works at a fish store, so he can pretty much get anything. And he is getting some of the wildest corals, tunicates and sea fans, and, and he's dumping. He says the most expensive part of that tank is all the food he puts in it. And he's constantly feeding it all the time. And I, I'm hoping they will feature his tank in Coral Magazine because it's, out, it's amazing. Or... I'd like to go out and film his tank in person and share it with you guys. <laughs> okay, so Iris says, I have a 55 gallon tank, it's all in one with the factory, which is not great, protein skimmer and nitrates are around 30. I started carbon dosing, but I'm afraid with poor skimming it may create problems. Uh, thoughts on an algae reactor to bring the nitrates to less than 10. Actually, really the simplest thing is a ginormous water change back to back. If you could just do a few big water changes. If you did a 27 and a half gallon water change, you know, 50% of your tank, which it really isn't that. You could probably change 25 and you're changing 50%. Um, you would cut your nitrate from 30 to 15. And if you did one more, you'd be at seven and a half. So just do two big water changes this week. 
It's so much simpler. You're not dealing with dosing. You're not doing anything. You're just changing water. I would recommend that. Let's see. Uh, Robert says, what is your blue acro? Is it the Cali Tord? So the one in the dead center is the Shadowcaster. And I gave it that name years ago because I have, I've asked everyone I know what it was called and no one no one knows where it came from. Everyone says I didn't get it from them. So I was like, all right, if that's the case, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to give it a name. And so I called it Shadowcaster because it created this giant shadow and everything underneath was dying <laughs> from lack of light. And it grew into a beast of a coral. And then a few years ago, Dwayne was here and we cut out a whole bunch and now it's regrowing. I do have two different blue torts in my aquarium, and one is a Cali tort, and one is an Oregon tort. And then there's the shadow caster. And if I move this over, you'll see the shadow caster over here on to my, uh, well, right up there next to that pink one. And that one right there would give you uh, a good view of it under daylight. That's the 10K metal halides I'm running. <clears throat> Uh, EJ says, are you going to film the reset of the frag tank? Oops, I need to move this up. Sorry, I covered up the words. I um, don't know. <laughs> the frag tank is just garbage. I mean, it's just, it's awful. It just needs to be completely cleaned. Maybe, yes. Maybe when I'm at the point, maybe there will be parts I'll share. I don't know. Maybe. Jay says, I had three outlets go on my original EB-8. I have three EB-8s now. I have one, two, three EB-8s, one EB-4, and two 832s. And they're all being used for different things. And I only have one bad outlet out of all of them. Robert says, loving your Reef Trace app. Very useful indeed. Thank you for letting me know that. I will tell that to Jose. Uh, Nicholas says, what time is it there? Well, what happens is, um, first of all, I'll answer your question. It is 3.37 p.m. It's Saturday. <laughs> and uh, I'm in Texas. Uh, but when I have the lights on behind me, there's nothing you can see. It just looks blown out. It looks like it's on fire. So I stopped all the metal halides from running. Just let the blue lights run in the background just for a normal glow. So that's what you're seeing behind me right now. It's just blue. Anything else looks kind of crappy. I'm not really happy with it. Um, let me look for the next question. Robert says, do you have an opinion on the ReefBot auto tester? The ReefBot is a great device to measure some of your test kits, and they're adding more and more kits, which is great. So you can actually, um, like if you like Salifert, you can use Salifert. If you like API, you can use API. They've been adding any kit that only uses liquid, can you can be used in the reef bot. The limiting factor of the reef bot is there's only room for so many vials. So like what I was saying to some people, you know, a year ago, if you had the trident that's measuring alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium, and you had the reef bot measuring nitrate and phosphate, and you have the salinity probe, the temperature probe, and the pH probe measuring those, you've covered everything. And all you did was use two different machines plus a controller. So I, I think that's great. I haven't personally used it, but I've seen it several times. I know quite a few people that have one and seem to be very happy. I've considered getting one, even though I have nowhere to put it. <laughs> I kind of feel like the turf scrubber like filled in my system to where I'm maxed out. And I really don't like putting more and more things on the floor because I like to have the room to walk around in the fish room and not have to avoid tripping over things or having things get spilled on things. So I haven't done that. Let's see. Uh, Christian Coral says, how do I order from your website as I live in the UK? And how do I pay for it as I never order from the USA and I would pay for it in dollars or pounds sterling? What will happen is you will give me your postal code and an email so I can, and you're going to tell me exactly what you want and how many of that thing you want. And then I will get a quote from the post office to find out what it's going to cost to ship to you. Then I tell you, and if you say, I love that, I will send you an invoice. And that will be a PayPal invoice, and it will be paying me in US dollars. 
I guess during the payment process, it knows to convert. That part, I have no idea. I always receive US dollars. But it's, it's kind of a little bit more involved rather than you're just adding things to the cart and doing it yourself. You get a little bit more hands-on help from me. See people talking about me. Hey, we got done with all the questions. Is the stream over? <laughs> um, all right, yeah. Like I said, if you guys have more questions, we can talk for a little bit longer. We're about an hour and a half in, and uh, we uh, any question, just put at Milo's Reef so I can find it. Let me move this over so you can see the other side of the tank for a while because you were looking at the anemone. Scoot me way over here. Uh, I do want to tell you, someone in Club... Oh, let me mention this. Club Miller's Reef. i got to move myself again. Hang on. Actually, I'll just move the thing over. Hang on. So Club Miller's Reef is a group that I created on um, Facebook almost two years ago. And we're coming up on 8,000 members. And I do recommend that you join Club Miller's Reef because that's where we talk about our tanks every single day. You know, we're on YouTube. We talk with each other in live chat. I and mean, there may be some question and answers under the bottom of this video later, and I answer those. But daily, I'm reachable on Facebook in Club Milo's Reef. And so it's just facebook.com slash groups slash Milo's Reef. And in that group, someone posted how he had a experience where his alkalinity would not cooperate. And he kept dosing more and more and more. And he was also doing his weekly water changes. And it seemed like he was getting things to work, but he just... It was a struggle, and he couldn't understand why his tank needed so much alkalinity. And then one day he was down in the cabinet underneath, looking at his uh, somp, and he saw this huge area of something white in his cabinet. And what had happened was the hose that dosed the alkalinity had fallen out of the sump and was dosing alkalinity into the cabinet. And so it was just dumping it in. And the more he dosed, the more he dumped it into the cabinet. It never got in the water, it never got in the aquarium. And the only reason his aquarium survived is because he kept doing the weekly water changes. So he was telling everyone, you know, don't discount your water changes. They're very important. In his case, it saved his tank. And, you know, he, he taught us a valuable lesson. Double check where those tubes are. So, I mean, every week, because a lot of you use dosing pumps. And so I always recommend to you guys, double check your dosing pumps every single week. You know, hit the test button if you need to. Calibrate them once in a blue moon. <laughs> You know, I mean, I don't know that you calibrate them more than once a year, but you probably should be calibrating them every two or three months to verify that the number coming out is the number you're programming. If you want 13 milliliters to come out and it's only coming out at seven, what good is that? Because you're just going to increase the number and you're going to think in your head, well, I need 25, when really you don't. Your, your pump got out of calibration. So calibrate the pumps, make sure the tubes are securely in the sump or clipped on the tank or clipped in the overflow box or wherever they are, Make sure liquid is coming out of all the tubes. You know, you might have to take the end of the tube and crush it between your fingertips to break up any hard stuff so that liquid can flow out. And my own personal hack is to put a little tiny power head, these little tiny ones. It's like an inch by an inch by an inch. I found some adorable thing at Macna, and there's so many things online. You could find whatever you need, or maybe just have some old power head. Stick it underneath, pointing straight up where the liquid drips in from the doser. So as soon as it hits the water, it's mixing instead of dropping a bunch of alkalinity into one area and hoping the flow will move it, that's not a good approach. Instead, have a power head underneath blowing straight up. The dose comes down. It, it tumbles, mixes, and spreads and goes into the water column gets into your tank. So you got to stay on top and make sure your dosing pumps are securely located in your sump where they can't fall. Make sure the tubing's where it belongs. Make sure liquid comes out of the tube and make sure the containers are not empty. And if you did all that, you're doing a great job. So anyway, that was a story that was shared in Club Miller's Reef. Another story that was shared this week was a guy, uh, Tim, who has a 550-gallon tank, and it started leaking right from the middle of the side seam, and so he's got five clamps holding the aquarium together right now while he's dealing with what's next, which means break down the tank and drain it. So anyway, I welcome you guys to Club Miller's Reef. If you haven't been added yet, it's just because I was out of town for a few days, and there's about 40, 50 people waiting right now. We are very strict in that group. You have to be nice. 
we're so mean. We make you be nice. And uh, if uh, you're not nice, you get thrown out. <laughs> it's that simple. We've tried to create a nice, friendly bubble where anyone can ask any question and not be scared of being made fun of or attacked. And that has worked very well thus far. And that, that's why we have some moderators, and their job is to keep the peace. So if you are in the group um, and you're enjoying it, I'm glad. And if you're new to the group, be sure you watch the rules video because words actually do matter. I actually care about what you say. And uh, if you're having a bad day, don't visit the group. Seriously, go yell at somebody else. <laughs> All right, let me go back to the questions. Uh, Lamont says, I have two small, I have, I have small patches of algae in my sump, nowhere else. Should I clean them out? Yes. I would remove whatever is bothering you in your system before it can spread elsewhere. So if you see something that is removable, I'd remove it. Uh, in my own refugium, I had this weird red bubble algae that never appeared in my tank. And I would remove it as it caused problems in the refugium, but the rest of the time I didn't worry about it. But if any of it got into my tank, I'd be very worried. So yeah, I would definitely control the problem early, right now, while you can. You found it, handle it, remove it, solve the problem. Uh, Trevor says, I have three heaters in my setup. Two are used on the Inkbird controller, and the third one is on a UPS. Um, and it's set a couple of degrees lower so it doesn't wear out and gives the power a chance to come on. That sounds good. Uh, Adam says, I went back watching some of your older videos and was curious about the stand on your tank. It's crazy how it doesn't have a center support. Uh, my stand is steel. It's used, it's quarter inch steel, so quarter inch thick, and it's two inch by two inch square tubing. And when the guy welded it for me, he actually said that the long tubes, you know, the, the full length of the tank, would be two inch by three inch tubing. And then when he delivered it, it was all two by two. And I said to him, we agreed on three by two. It was like an I-beam. I wanted to be strong. And he just looked at me and says, you didn't need it. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So, and I mean, I've had the stand now for 10 years. And uh, I have not needed it. So it's very strong. It took four grown men to bring it in here. It was so heavy. And uh, it's, you know, it's doing really, really well. But I intentionally did not want legs in the middle. I wanted a very sturdy tank, uh, stand that I could work in from all four sides without any problems. By the way, if you're looking for more pictures of the stand, you can actually see the steel stand on my website. Go to MillersReef.com and in the menu, click on My Tanks, and then you know, you'll go to the 400 gallon, and there's an article just about the stand, and there's an article just about the aquarium, and there's an article just about the lighting. So it's all there for you to peruse and learn more about without having to work your way through a long video. Uh, Aaron says, do you know of any corals that would be good for propagation? What do you mean? Like, good to sell, or you just want to try your hand at fragging and growing out corals? Because pretty much almost every coral we buy was propagated or can be propagated. Let's see. Elmer says, what's your oldest fish? That one right there. No, I keep pointing the wrong direction. So that's Spock that just swam by, and then right in the middle of the shot is my purple tang by the feeding clip, and I've had both of those fish. There's Spock right there coming at the camera. Uh, both those fish I've had since 2004. So 16 years old. Um, Chad says, what happens with the Radeon XR30 if the Wi-Fi is gone? Uh, I don't have an answer to you on that yet. The, uh, it just depends. The previous versions of the Radeons before the Gen, so anything below Gen 5, so Gen 4 and older, works with ReefLink, and it's how we control them. They are slowly um, rolling out the Mobius control to more and more users, not everyone at once. So people are getting a notification. You can now use uh, your gear with Mobius, and that'll all be Bluetooth controlled. But I don't know what they're going to do and I assume we'll find out in the coming months or in the next year, what they're going to do about controlling your Ecotech equipment when you're not in front of the aquarium. Because a lot of people feel very firmly they should have the ability to control the lights or the pumps or the dosing or whatever when they're out of town. Like, turn something on or turn something off for their spouse who's working on the tank in person rather than because they're not there. And I, I do think that's important. I'm kind of surprised that 
I because I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised that they went with the well, you can control it as long as you're standing within so many feet of it, but um, what happens when you're abroad, you know, or when you're anywhere else? I just I don't really quite get why that is, what their thought process was, or what the plan is to overcome that hurdle in the future. Oh, and he did a follow-up, and he says he meant if the Wi-Fi were to go out. Well, if your Wi-Fi goes out temporarily, you just can't do anything until your Wi-Fi is back. Uh, Jay says, any tips on pulling large rock out of a system to cut the corals off and replace it with different rock? I saw uh, your overhaul, was wondering if you had any tips that you might have picked up. When we tore out all the corals on my tank, we didn't touch any of the rock. Matter of fact, Dwayne says, your aquascape is perfect. I wouldn't change one thing. And I, that was a nice compliment. And so we just planted some new corals on the existing rock. We didn't remove any real rock from the tank that I can recall. I think everything came off the rock. There may have been one big colony of something where it came out and we knocked the coral off and put the rock right back in. But if you're going to go ahead and put different rock inside your aquarium, I would make sure that it's been uh, curing in salt water for weeks or even months. So that way when you put it in the tank, the tank doesn't skip a beat. It doesn't have some weird surprise. I, I can tell you for a fact, and I've done this on a couple of occasions, which it's really dumb, but I would need like one rock, you know, one, I just need a small rock and I'd have one in the yard. I'm like, eh, I'll throw it in the tank. The tank's huge. And you could just see the tank was miserable for a few weeks. Something was in that rock that just wasn't, didn't taste right. So I don't, you know, recommend just introducing some new rock. Make sure it's a rock you've had for a while and then you can put it in the system. But sometimes you need another piece of rock in your tank for a place to place more corals or to help support because of a rock slide and you're trying to get the jigsaw puzzle to hold together again. Um, I do like using putty to hold things in place, but putty's not forever. It's good, but it is something you can pull apart if need be. But uh, other than that, you know, if I did take rock out of the tank, I kept it wet the whole time, removed the coral and got the, the rock right back into the tank immediately before anything could die off. Uh, Mike says, have you seen the Mastertronic that's coming out? I, I'm loving my Alcatronic. The uh, Mastertronic was uh, was introduced at Macna. It was like, this thing is coming to market. But that's as much as I know. It's just what I talked to them at the time. Uh, Steve says, does Zinnia help reduce nitrate? My nitrate increased when I gave away a lot of Zinnia away. Yeah, actually it does. It is one of those nitrate reducing corals and the more Zinnia you have, it can help to keep them under control. Some people have done that. They've used that instead of, um, well, other choices and it did work. But yeah, anytime you make a big change on the tank, it's gonna, you're gonna see something change. Like for example, I did live rock enhance my tank and uh, it definitely got cleaner. But then for like one week, my nitrate was measuring higher on the test kit. Then it goes back down again. Um, okay, Hamada says, I recently started testing for phosphates and I'm getting 0.16 ppm. I know it's higher because I'm using the ultra low test, the Red Sea, but I have zero algae and my nitrates are five to 10. I also tested my RODI unit. I'm getting 0 0.04 phosphates and 0 0.2 nitrates. And I recently changed all the filters in my RO unit. It's a five-stage BRS unit. And I think he didn't type anything else. So um, number one, don't test your RODI water for nitrate and phosphate because it's going to freak you out and it's not true. It's the water is DI water. It's too pure and the test kits can't read it correctly. So just don't do that. Your uh, Phosphates in your tank were measuring 0.16, and that is perfectly fine. You do not have to sweat it. That is nice and low. It could be lower, or it could be like my tank could be much higher. My tank, last time I checked it, was at least 0.5, maybe even 0.75, and I still don't have algae issues in my tank. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, 0.16, perfectly fine. Stop thinking about your, your RODI system. I, this happens to everyone. It happened to me at one point. I was trying to figure out a problem and I started testing my DI water and I was totally losing my mind. I was frustrated. I tried different brands of DI. I tried everything I could. I, I was testing with different kits and I was like, oh my God. And it, it, was, <laughs> it was this whole thing. I wrote a giant blog about it on Reef Addicts. And in the end, it was just DI water can't be tested because it's ion free. It throws off everything. Okay. Uh, Jay says, 
he was talking about removing corals from a rock. Yes, you can definitely use a bandsaw. I've done that before. I've, I've sawn things right off a rock, and it'll cut right through the rock because the rock isn't super hard. Um, our rock that we buy for our aquariums usually is reasonably porous. And as long as you uh, don't twist and break the blade, you're good. Those blades are kind of expensive. They're like 70, 80 bucks. So take your time, don't force it and let it do its thing. Or focus on cutting off the coral with different tools, like you said. You know, I've used bone cutters. I've, I've done the Dremel thing. I've used a Dremel cutting wheel and I've used the bands. I've used all different ones. It just depends what kind of coral you're even dealing with. Some are easier than others. RC Jedi says, where did the name Milev come from? Well, Milev is just the initials of my name, Mark E. Levinson. So M-E-L-E-V. And uh, then I called it Milev's Reef because I needed a name for my website. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people want to say Melev, but since, I don't know, in my head, when I see M-E, I think of the word me. And since it's about me, I just say me Lev. Because, and I say Lev instead of leave because Levinson. <laughs> So it's me, Lev. That's what I've always said. I know it confuses people. Uh, Aaron says, I'd be looking for good corals to grow and sell for bad money. Okay, so if you're trying to propagate corals to sell, you want to propagate things that people want to buy. Uh, Acropora are popular. Zoanthas are popular. Gargonians are popular. Um, can't really frag out things like fungias very efficiently. Some people like to sell anemones. So, I mean, there's, there's actually a lot of choices out there. I guess the first thing you could do, honestly, would be go to different websites that sell corals and see what they are selling to kind of get a feel for what appears to be the market. I don't sell corals. I barely touch mine. I don't like to even cut them. So I'm not the best person to talk to about this, but Acropore are easy to frag. Zoanthids are easy to frag. Um, what else? Chalices are easy to frag. I was trying to think what else is in my tank. <laughs> But uh, I, I let everything get bigger and bigger instead of selling. Uh, Charlie says, do you know of any good lights for an anemone only, including fish in, or inverts tank? Um, I plan on bubble tip anemones, crisps, and sea bay anemones, and mini max anemones. Okay, you can't put all those anemones in a tank. It's not going to work. Uh, you're going to have something that's going to happen in there. It's a chemical warfare called allelopathy. And you, when you set up in a tank that's anemones, it's going to have to be one family. So like my tank, the one that's in this picture right here, I'll get out of the way for a second here. Let me shrink this down. This right here is my anemone cube, and that's all bubble tip anemones. That's all that's in this tank, nothing else. And I've even heard some sellers say, if you put different uh, types of bubble tip anemones in there, like the more rare or more expensive ones, a lot of times they don't do well or the other ones don't do well. So even bubble tips with High-end bubble tips don't live well. But trying to mix in mini maxis, trying to mix in uh, the sea bays. I, I had a sea bay in this tank with all these bubble tips, and it shriveled away, and I removed it and put it in my reef. And that's the big anemone that's in my tank now, five years later, that's doing really great because it got away from all these things. You're not going to be able to combine them. So you're going to have to pick a species you like and do it. If you want to have a tank filled with many, uh, mini maxi uh Carpet enemies, because they come in like 100 colors, you could fill the tank with those, then that's the kind you should use. But don't try to combine what you're suggesting. And then you asked about what lights. Uh, sky's the limit, there's so many kinds. I like the Radions because they're easy to program and they, they last forever. So that would be what I'd suggest. And you can turn them up or down based on your needs. Alrighty, um, I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to thank you guys so much for attending our live stream today. There's actually 245 of you on here right now at this moment, and we only got two thumbs down, so that's a win. <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in. There will be a live stream again next week. Um, I do have something I'm going to, I'm giving you more homework, uh, and I also need to talk about water testing, but let me tell you about the homework. I have, I talked about a movie that came out years ago called Coral Reef Adventure. It was a awesome movie that I saw a long time ago. It was filmed for the, uh, I've got all these words in my head and they're all combining into one thing. Uh, IMAX, thank you. <laughs> uh, 
It was filmed for IMAX projectors, and Coral Reef Adventure was a fantastic movie, and I want you guys to see it. So last night, we were talking about that movie on my Instagram video that I did my live stream, and I found it on YouTube. Unbelievable! And it's on a channel that only has 32 subscribers, so YouTube never noticed it's there, I guess? <laughs> I don't know how this commercial copywritten movie is on that channel, but I'm going to go ahead and give you that video to watch as homework, because I think you're going to love it. Um, it's really nice. It's not one of these videos where it shows a bunch of dying corals like we tend to get these days. And I loved it so much that I saw it four times in the theater. Uh, the fourth time I saw it, our club went to see it as a group. Like 80 of us all came to the theater at once. It was so fun. And we watched the final viewing, or uh, the final showing of Coral Reef Adventure. And then after uh, it was over, then we went downstairs um, and we went into this room and we had a raffle and we drank and snacked on stuff and they all went home and that was it. And that movie went away. And I found it on YouTube. So I'm going to put it in this video's description as soon as the stream ends. And I want you guys to watch it. It's about 45 minutes long. And then next week we'll talk a little bit about that movie. So that's why it's your homework. Because <laughs> I need you to see it. And we're going to talk a little bit about it. I'm going to do some reading this week. I have a book of the making of that video. I want to reread part of it and I'll share some tidbits with you about it. But I felt like it was kind of weird to talk about the behind the scenes of a video, video that you've never seen. So I'm going to put the link to it. You're going to watch it. You're going to love it. And next week on the live stream, we'll start off the stream talking about that first. Uh, and then also, today is water test Saturday. Some of you are not testing regularly and I need you to break that bad, bad habit and start taking good or better care of your aquarium. And I know that sounds kind of judgy, and I don't mean to be judgy. I'm trying to keep your, your reeflings happy and healthy. So please test your water. Test everything. Use your test kits. You bought them for a reason. Use them. They don't last forever. They do expire. So I need you to get your test kits. I need you to measure everything. See what your water parameters are. Make any adjustments that are necessary. Clean your protein skimmer. Matter of fact, last night, my protein skimmer on the frag tank was full. And I was in bed trying to go to sleep, and I thought, you know that thing's going to overflow if I don't deal with it right this minute. So I just walked into a pitch dark fish room, I threw a bucket on the floor, I just took the cup off, dumped it in a bucket, put the cup back on, and went back to bed. So take a minute to clean your skimmers before they overflow back into your system. Make sure everything's running right. Make any adjustments in your dosing so that your numbers are good. And keep your glass nice and clean and enjoy your reefs. And I hope you guys have a great week. And I'll see you next Saturday at 2 o'clock Central Time. Bye!